Dear friends, hello and welcome to another episode of Strategy International Podcast. As you already know, this is the podcast produced for Strategy International. It's a global think tank with a wide array of experts specializing on different areas such as uh, international policy, uh, international affairs, defense, security, the economy, the environment, and much, much more. You can always visit Strategy International website at www.strategyinternational.org for uh, a bunch of publications, opinion editorials, and uh, uh, and uh, to get to see all the expertise that Strategy International is involved with. Speaking of experts, we have another amazing guest today, Dr. Mohamed Badin El Yatiwi. Thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you for your invitation. I appreciate your time. We're going to talk about something that we haven't yet spoken about uh, on the podcast. We're going to talk about uh, Latin America and specifically Brazil. Um, very excited about that. Before we get to that, uh, however, uh, let me just introduce you formally to our uh, to our viewers and our listeners. You are the program director, uh, master in diplomacy at the American University in the Emirates. Uh, I, I, you know, before we get started, I like you know on a personal level just to ask our guests, you know, what attracted you to follow this career you know to 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 have an interest in in politics and in diplomacy and international policy uh thank you for this first question so i always had the uh, strong interest since since uh, i'm a kid or a teenager about uh, international politics uh my family was always interesting about these uh, different topics and uh, what also helped me i always traveled a lot in different countries because my family is in different parts of the world and uh, also the fact that i'm speaking four languages also helped uh, helped me to to be connected to different uh, cultures different things and trying to understand how uh, the dynamics are working at uh, at a global level and uh, i decided uh, during my uh, my studies to to specialize myself in uh, international relations i think really really uh, at the beginning of uh, my bachelor Mm-hmm. That's fa- that's fascinating. Um, let's get on to our topic. We're going to talk about Brazil. Uh, very interesting things happening uh, in that uh, part of the world. We just saw an election that was quite intense. Uh, we saw uh, uh, an electorate that was pretty divided through the uh, through the results. It was nearly fifty fifty. Um, and, and and I want to ask you just in general, because we have been noticing, um, at least more so recently uh, in the U.S., uh, I have a feeling that it's probably coming here in Canada well uh, as well. We're noticing this political polarization. I don't know if it's the last two to three years what we went through with a different government's positions on handling the pandemic. Uh, I don't know if this polarization was always there or or that we just didn't have that. Uh, access to information because of social media and everything going on now. Uh, but it's definitely present. And we also saw it in Brazil as well. What is the reason for this, do you think? Why are people camped, uh, you know, ideologically and so polarizing in, in different parts of the world? Uh, I think we, we have different uh, different cases. Uh, but for the countries like Canada or the United States, or UK, for example, with the Brexit mm-hmm. 2016, with a strong division between uh, the British people. Uh, we have like a crisis, you know, of uh, liberal democracy. We always had oppositions to big parties. This is normal, uh, Tories and Labour or Democrats and Republicans. But now we have some uh, tensions and uh, we can see that uh, in general, for example, in the US, if you were se- in the centre, if you were a moderate, uh, candidate from the Republicans or the Democrats, you were the, the good one, the good choice. Now you you should uh, be a little bit like uh, uh, provocative. Yeah. Uh, in the case of Latin America, 
uh, we can have some comparisons, but uh, the, the Latin American societies were always, I think, more divided uh, with uh, more, uh, I will say, violence, not only physical violence, but also in the arguments, you know. Um, some uh, countries during the Cold War uh, choose to, to support the United States. We had uh, dictators supported by the United States. Some others had some other dictators supported by USSR. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, and it's something that is related also to to the history of uh, the Latin American countries with strong divisions from the beginning, from the 19th century. Uh, what is interesting with the case of uh, of Brazil is that we have Bolsonaro, who uh, chose as a model uh, as Donald Trump, mm -hmm. and uh, it's something really really interesting. I think all the countries, all the democratic countries, are in this uh, strong division. It's uh, like a consequence of the globalization. Uh, we have some really positive things with the globalization process that started decades ago. And we have at the same time some, uh, uh, can say, bad consequences or uh, consequences for that are bad for one part of the society. And it's easier for uh, some people that we can call populist or we can use another adjective, but uh, some people who are using this uh, threat, who are using um, this, uh, this pain, to also uh, try to win elections. So saying that it's the fault of uh, the, some one part of the population or some other countries or et cetera. Yeah, it's very interesting because, you know, traditionally in the past, even though people used to camp themselves either in the left or in the right, there was always this, this consent in the middle, right? If you were in the middle, you could get things done. It seems as though that middle ground is slowly slowly kind of dissipating and you either have to camp yourself i am in the right or i'm in the left and we're going to battle it out and see what happens and we saw that in the in, in the recent results in the brazil election in the case of brazil uh, no one was expecting a comeback of lula as a candidate for, for what happened because if we we want to understand why bolsonaro won uh, four years ago it's also because uh, after Lula, uh, who was in power from 2003 to 2010, we had Dilma Rousseff from the same party, uh, the workers, party of workers, who initiate a new mandate. And uh, she, she could not finish her mandate because the parliament decided, the Congress decided that uh, she did not uh, respect some rules and uh, they had some big issues with corruption. So Temer took the power and the crisis of the Brazilian democracy with Temer, who was center-right, permitted to someone like Bolsonaro to say, look, Temer is corrupted, center-right, center-left are also corrupted with Lula and Dilma Rousseff. So now... The only option is, is me, you know. So it's something that uh, that worked uh, the first time he was elected. Uh, he had some issues uh, during the management of the COVID period. It was uh, one of the countries who suffered a lot with uh, the lack of coordination between uh, the president, his govern between the president and his government first, between the government and the different states because it's a federal country like the US, for example. So. We had a big lack of coordination and also between some municipalities and uh, some governors or some municipalities and some members of the government. And the problem is that when we are talking about uh, cities, for example, if you speak about Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro, it's not a city with only one or two million people. We are talking about huge uh, cities and uh, it, it's a big problem because uh, we can see that Bolsonaro after all the things he did bad or he did not do, uh, he still have 50%. Exactly, exactly. And we're seeing through the results now that there's, again, a political and ideological shift. You had a right-wing government and, well, the elections are very close, but, I mean, Bolsonaro uh, accepted the results and now we're going to the other side of the spectrum. Um, what does that mean for Lula's strategy? domestically you know how difficult or how easy will it be for him to govern such a divided electorate i think it will be really hard for him to to govern uh, first of all because of the division of the society it's 50 50 also because he will not have the control of the congress so it will be really hard for him and also because bolsonaro uh, still have some ideological influence uh, 
mm-hmm. with some medias, intellectuals, politicians, but also because some governors are now in favor of Bolsonaro. So mm-hmm. it will be complicated for Lula to, to manage. The, the real difference between Lula and Bolsonaro, I'm pretty sure of that, will be the foreign policy. Uh-huh. Because when Lula was in power 2003-2010, he uh, invented a new way to do uh, diplomacy for Brazil. Uh, he changed many things regarding uh, the tradition of the Brazilian foreign policy. Dilma Rousseff tried to continue with a different style, but with the same vision. And since 2015-2016, uh, with Temer and after with Bolsonaro, we had some uh, big changes uh, regarding what Lula tried to do. And I'm sure that Lula will try to show his difference with Bolsonaro, especially in the foreign policy. He will try, obviously, in domestic policies, but uh, it will be harder for him. The international level is something that is really good for for uh, Lula because he can show that he's totally the opposite of Bolsonaro. Mm-hmm. They, uh, they don't have uh, any uh, common point and uh, any uh, vision in common regarding uh, all the international uh, topics. I want to talk to you a little bit about the domestic policy of Brazil, and it's interesting to see how Lula changed it um, and how Bolsonaro afterwards kind of you know, closed Brazil to the to, to the outside world, if you wish, a little bit with his policies and, you know, the challenge now ahead for Lula to bring back uh, uh, Brazil. But before we get to that, I, I just want to focus a little bit more regionally. How, he, how How is his election, how is Lula's election seen from the neighboring countries in South America? Um, will this political or ideological shift impact at all the region? What is yes. the sentiment uh, on the ground in South America? Are they more happy uh, about this election? Uh, are they happy to see him back? Look, they're, they're happy. Why? Uh, because in the majority of uh, Latin American countries, now we have a uh, left-wing mm-hmm. president. For the first time, Colombia chose a left-wing president with Gustavo right. Petro. We have Boric in Chile, but it's also something uh, historical. We have uh, Luis Arce in Bolivia. Uh, Fernandez in uh, Argentina, and now uh, we have uh, Lula, who is coming back. Uh, we cannot say that Lula is the same, because when we say left-wing or uh, social democrats or socialist parties in Latin America, each country has its own, uh, you know, own definition, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, for example, uh, 20 years ago, it was not possible to compare Chavez and Lula. They were totally <laughs> It was not possible to compare to compare Lula and Bachelet in Chile. They were different. So uh, that's why it's also interesting to see how they will try to coordinate. Uh, but for sure, it's better for them, from their perspective, to negotiate uh, and to discuss with Lula and to discuss with Bolsonaro. And um, we can imagine that the first thing that he will do at a regional level regarding Latin America will be to change uh, Bolsonaro's position regarding Venezuela, because Bolsonaro was considering that Juan Guaido, the opposite member of the opposition, right wing, is the president of Venezuela. And for Lula, for sure, he will try to change the position and to maintain uh, a normal relation with Maduro. That is also something that uh, is important for all the region, because the impact of what is happening in Venezuela it has direct impact for Brazil, for Colombia, etc. Isn't that position going to bring him in conflict with the rest of the Western world, for example? Because I know the U.S. and Canada and a lot of Ooh. the Western countries show support um, uh, for, uh, for Guido. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but Lula always mentioned one thing when he was president 20 years ago, and he confirmed during the electoral campaign. He considered that Brazil is an independent country with an independent foreign policy. And this is a big difference with Bolsonaro and also with the presidents who were before Lula, before 2003. Uh, You have two big visions, two big doctrines in uh, the Brazilian foreign policy. The majority always consider that Brazil is part of a Western world. They should have good relations with the US, uh, good relations with Canada, with uh, Western Europe, etc. Lula considered that, yes, it's important, but it's important only if it's the, the interest of Brazil. And it's more important for Brazil to have its own foreign policy, to be the leader of 
Latin America and especially South America because we always have this competency with Mexico and mm -hmm. trying to isolate, isolate uh, the Mexicans. So he wants to be the leader of uh, South America. It will be easy because Brazil is Brazil and we cannot compare the economy, the population and uh, the, the capacities of Brazil with uh, the rest of uh, the Latin American countries. Uh, we have this uh, project to be in competition with the U.S., to not always say yes to the U.S., depending on the interest. And what is really important for uh, Lula, uh, I'm sure of that, will be to build bridges with uh, what he's calling the Global South or South-South cooperation. So we can remember that 20 years ago, he tried to be part of a negotiation regarding uh, Iran and the nuclear program. Uh, I'm sure that he will try to have good relations with Turkey. Now, uh, because Turkey is trying to do the same, NATO, but at the same time we are talking mm -hmm. with Putin and we are friends with everybody. So uh, friends and enemies at the same time with everybody. So it will be one of the problems for Lula because, uh, the, look, the Brazilian economy is depending now more on China than US. And this was one of the biggest critics against Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro was always considering that he was a close, really close a partner of the United States during the Trump mandate. But at the same time, the first economic partner since 2009 of Brazil during Lula's period is China. Mm -hmm. So you have a, a contradiction to say our enemy is China because it's the enemy of the US. Right. And at the same time to have uh, the first investor and the first economic partner and commercial partner uh, who is China. So for Lula, it will be easier to play with that and for sure, it will generate a lot of tensions uh, with the Western world and especially with Biden, for sure. It was interesting. I mean, I didn't follow the elections that closely, um, but, uh, you know, having read a little bit, it seemed as though his platform um, and his policies, you know, gave the impression more of a Brazil that wants to focus on nationalization. Um, and that could be potentially seen um, as an issue, especially as a, as a big country and a big important economy that Brazil is in that region. It's interesting to hear you speak because, yes, we can accept the fact that Brazil wants to have its own uh, international policy, but at the same time, it's in a region where he has almost no choice but to uh, adhere to the Western kind of partnerships that are that are in place. And this is going to be an interesting shift, at least I'm curious to see how things develop, because internationally, the former president, Bolsonaro, was often seen as kind of this countercurrent politician or leader. Right. Um, how is Lula's election seen on an international level? Look, if we analyze, uh, for example, it's, it was very difficult for uh, the United States and uh, for the European Union because Bolsonaro had really bad relations with all of them. Now that it's Biden and especially for, with Emmanuel Macron in France, mm -hmm. in Europe, it was, uh, they were uh, close to fight uh, every day about all the topics. So I think that we are happy to see that Lula is coming back. And um, Lula did something the first time and I think that he will do the same, uh, like in 2003. Uh, this is the big difference between Lula and some other uh, left-wing uh, leaders in Latin America. When Lula came to power in 2003, people were asking the same, what will happen, etc. Which is it's normal. Uh, he never, never, never attacked the, uh, the diplomats. Mm -hmm. He used some official diplomats with a strong experience to be his own diplomats. For example, Amorim was his minister of foreign affairs during the two mandates, and he's a really important diplomat. When he finished and Dilma Rousseff became president, this same guy, Celso Amorim, became minister of defense mm -hmm. for years. So he used people who have all the background, all the knowledge, all the capacity to negotiate, all also the network at an international level to do it. So we, we, that, this is smart because when you have like new ideas and new people, it's uh, difficult to negotiate with countries like uh, US or some European countries. So I think he will do the same. Now it will be really complicated because uh, they will ask him 
what he wants to do regarding free trade agreements, what he wants to do regarding climate change, etc. Climate change, I think he will be a really good partner for the Western world. Regarding the free trade, it will be more complicated, especially for the European Union, because uh, the agreement uh, at, during the Bolsonaro mandate was not accepted like that by the European Union, especially Emmanuel Macron uh, criticized this agreement and we had a series of uh, insults uh, from uh, uh, some ministers of Brazil like uh, Guedes, uh, who attacked, I remember, the wife of Macron regarding that. So it was a little bit, you know, uh, disgusting. But uh, I think with Lula, we will have oppositions, but we will not have this kind of fights. We'll have oppositions, different argumentation, different ideology, different visions, but it will be more respectful. And for Lula, uh, what you mentioned about the national vision, he is focused on Brazil because he's focused on the people who vote for, voted for him, so mm -hmm. the workers and the middle class. But he's also uh, defending something that is a multilateralism. He's considering, and his advisors also are considering, that Brazil is the natural leader of Latin America, and everyone is agree about that. And But Brazil should be also one of the leaders of the global south. Mm -hmm. So, and at the same time, to be a partner of the Western world. That's why it's a little bit complicated. And to choose, to choose, depending the topic, the interest of Brazil. Right. So this is something interesting for, for so, so so what aside from that, what are his uh, his main challenges on an interna at the international stage? Is he prepared for these challenges? I mean, he's been away for uh, for, for quite for quite some time. He's coming back now. Um, you know, given the completely different uh, ideology that he he's coming in with, will there be a significant shift in strategy? Um, and if so, is it going to be to the detriment of the Brazilian uh, people? The, the problem for him will be to, to combine the interest of the people who voted for him with the interest of the Brazilian companies and businessmen. Mm -hmm. We'll have a big problem inside the, for the domestic politics, but also for international affairs because he will represent Brazil, obviously, and he will have to deal also with the interests of people who are not voting for him and will never support him. So this is also something uh, difficult. And the other uh, thing that is interesting that you mentioned in your question is that, yes, he left the power for 12 years, close to 13. So, of course, a lot of things change uh, at the global level, it's changing every day. We are uh, living from crisis to crisis now. But it will be also interesting to see how his health, because he's not a young guy, mm -hmm. how he can uh, manage that. Because Lula, president 20 years ago, was a president who was traveling a lot. Had He had also this capacity. And I think he still had, had the capacity, but I don't know if he has the, the, the capacity, physical capacity to, to do it to uh, create and to maintain personal relations with the leaders. So this is this will be really interesting, and it will be also something decisive for uh, its foreign policy. I want to bring it back uh, domestically, because obviously a country is as good internationally as it could maintain itself domestically. And with this division that we saw during this election and the, the, the really close results, uh, I mean, only into. I mean, still now there are people that are contesting these results. There were massive protests. Um, what do you think the strategy should be to 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 quiet people down and for government to start uh, in a responsible manner uh, to function? And can it function? I presume that it will be really difficult for him because yes, Bolsonaro mentioned to his staff to start to work on the transition with Lula. He tried also at the same time to have some discussions with the Supreme Court and it was not accepted. Uh, the Supreme Court decided last week or so to uh, give him a fine to Bolsonaro <laughs> for uh, for asking to the Supreme Court, considering that he did not have any argument uh, so that he was doing it only to like to, to win some time. Um, the problem for, for Lula really will be the capacity of uh, some part of the civil society, 
to accept. I'm thinking about uh, the corporate sector and uh, some businessmen who are really important. How the army will also work? Because, you know, when Bolsonaro was uh, president, uh, at around 40% of uh, his government were, was coming from the militaries. So it would be interesting to see how the army will react now because Bolsonaro was uh, the candidate of a great part of the army, a big part of the army. So it will be interesting to see how he is dealing with and the relation with some governors and some mayors will be interesting. But I presume that for Lula, it will be really difficult because he has also another uh, issue is uh, that the price the price uh, of energy is really, really, really uh, high. So we'll have an inflation that is affecting a lot of the people that voted for him. So I don't know how he will deal with that because 20 years ago, he created a lot of social programs. He supported a lot of people and it gave him a lot of prestige. But uh, now it's not possible to do that. It's, uh, it's almost impossible to do that. So I don't know how he will manage at a domestic level the political economy and how he can find some solutions because mm -hmm. uh, the situation is, uh, is really bad and uh, a big part, a big proportion of the Brazilian society is suffering. Was the military was the military always that actively uh, involved? Uh, in, in the politics in Brazil, you mentioned Bolsonaro um, having chosen a lot of his close advisors from the military. Um, is it not something that usually should scare people when the military is so close to government? This is interesting because everybody in Brazil was convinced that the militaries will not play a game in the politics again. Because from the 60s, 1964 to 1985, Brazil was a military dictator. Mm -hmm. And uh, after 1985 and the transition till the end of the 80s, uh, it was for everyone, right wing, left wing, uh, something normal to say, OK, we'll have only civilians who will deal with uh, politics and the army will do uh, its job, but uh, will not be involved in uh, political decisions. And to have someone like Bolsonaro was a military, not a high level, but he was a military. He's fascinated by the dictator, so this is also interesting. And uh, he promoted the role of the army in politics. So the question is, is Bolsonaro only a parenthesis for years and some people were fascinated? I'm not sure, because when we see the result of the election, it was 50-50. So this means that maybe after Bolsonaro, we will still have people who believe in his ideas. A little bit like in the US with Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we know that Trump is not a young guy. So who knows if he will be candidate in 2024 or not. He wants, but we don't know. But for sure, his ideas are still uh, defended and supported by a big percentage of the US uh, society. I think it's the same for Brazil. And this is interesting because the difference between US and Brazil is that in US you have a clear rule of law. The army is not part of the no. politics in, in the US. Never. You know, mm -hmm. have a clear separation of powers, you have checks and balances. It's clear, you know, Trump can do what he wants, can say what he wants, but you have this rule of law. Uh, in the case of Brazil, it's different because you have this uh, history with uh, the military uh, dictature. So it will be interesting to see how um, Bolsonaro also will play with that in the opposition. If directly he will be involved as the first member of the opposition, or if some young people uh, who are uh, fans of Bolsonaro will try to uh, to continue what he what he did. I want to talk to you because the environment you mentioned it earlier on where uh, Lula is probably going to become a privileged partner um, with a lot of the environmental policies uh, that the West is trying to adopt. Uh, but that usually comes in conflict with energy efficiency. Uh, where does Brazil stand? I mean, it's a large country. Um, the environmental policies obviously impact directly Brazil. I mean, it, 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 as, a, as a country, it has to play an important role. 
but we have that other reality and it's not only brazil i mean i mean even europe now is having issues with um with the energy uh, sustainability where does brazil stand in that divide uh, that's why I was telling you that for Lula it will be really hard in comparison with uh, his first mandates 20 years ago. The situation changed a lot and also uh, the capacity to implement his own vision will be harder. So this is complicated. In the case of environment, climate change, the situation is worse than 20 years ago, obviously, everywhere, not only in Brazil. But... Um, I think he can play with something because uh, he's really pragmatic and uh, the energetical question was always uh, a priority for Brazil. Uh, and it's part of uh, the, the strategy and the foreign policy of the question of energy. I think he will play, he will be pragmatic, he will uh, defend at an international level in the COP and in all these uh, important events uh, a strong uh, support to uh, to these policies, to these international decisions, but at a domestic level, he will do uh, his best, you know, to to do it step by step. And if he cannot do it, he will say it's not my fault. It's a problem of the Congress, you know. You have some people from who are supporting Bolsonaro, and I cannot do my job. So he he's pragmatic, he's smart. So I think he will he will do that because he knows also that in this. Uh, situation that we are living, uh, the first people who will be uh, who will be affected by uh, these uh, big changes will be the people who voted for him. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the contradiction for uh, some left wing uh, candidates, not only in Brazil. Very interesting, uh, Mohammed. I don't want to take a lot of your time. I know that you're a very busy man. Uh, just before we wrap it up, is there anything interesting you're working on that you would like to share with our uh, viewers or our listeners anywhere they can follow you uh, and uh, uh, follow your work? You can follow me in my uh, LinkedIn. So you have my complete name, Dr. Mohammed Badin Eliatiwi. I'm sharing uh, all my publications, my interviews, and uh, also, I'm sharing some uh, some news and information. Same thing for uh, Facebook, Dr. Mohamed Badin Eliatiwi. And in Twitter is Dr. MBE. So I'm sharing information, publications. And uh, also, you can uh, send me a message if you are interested about anything about these topics. My, my specialization was Latin America during my PhD and the relation with the U.S. And now I'm uh, working for my personal research more in the relation between uh, MENA countries, Middle East, North African countries, with Latin American countries. So I'm working on Turkey, Brazil, Morocco, Mexico. So things that are uh, a little bit uh, strange, but uh, it's also interesting to have some other visions about uh, the international affairs and the global scenarios. Fantastic. I want to thank you again. I want to thank our listeners and viewers for uh, following the program. Uh, don't forget to visit www.strategyinternational.org for any further information on Strategy International and all the publications and the opinion editorials. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you all in the next episode. Thanks again, Mohammed. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Take care. Yeah.